right, we would like this to be kind of a, an interactive presentation. We, we don't want to do all the talking. We don't know everything there is to know about student-centered learning in Canvas, and we'd like to find out what you're doing and how you're keeping the, the students as the, at the center of your teaching and learning uh, in non-traditional learning environments. So first of all, just want to talk a little bit about where we're from. We're from the Utah College of Applied Technology, and there are eight uh, campuses across the state, which is symbolized by the, uh, the stars on the map there. Uh, Lee and I are from the top two there, Bridgerland and Ogden Weaver ATC. But within UCAT, we focus on technical and certificate training, and so we do a lot of, uh, a lot of open entry, open exit, competency-based learning. And we have some of our students are high school students and some of our post-secondary students. So let's talk about what we mean by non-traditional learning environments. Um, basically, <laughs> anything other than the traditional lecture-based sage, sage on the stage type environment is what we're talking about. And we'd like to, to just discuss some things with you about how Canvas can be used in some of those environments. So I've listed some of those up here. Competency-based learning, obviously, is a, is a different model where you're not focused so much on grades, but you're focused on learning competencies and mastery of those competencies. Also, uh, open entry, open exit is, is a radical change to what I'm used to, where we don't have a, a term-based course but students are beginning and ending at any time during that course. Um, flipped classrooms, how many are familiar with flipped classrooms? How many are teaching in flipped classrooms? Okay, a few. But the idea of a flipped classroom is to take the things in a traditional classroom that are typically done outside of the classroom, homework, and, and do that part in class. The, the instructor works closely with the students, and then the things that are typically done in class like lecturing, is, is put online or some other medium so the students do that outside of, of class. Then uh, online learning, I don't know if we can really consider that a, a non-traditional learning environment anymore, but uh, it is different than the, the traditional lecture-based uh, environment or some kind of a hybrid environment where part of it's online and part of it's face-to-face. -face. Then uh, project-based learning is another type of of learning which is focused heavily on, <laughs> on projects that the students work, work together on and, and learn by doing a project together. Um, are there other non-traditional student-centered learning environments that, that we're missing, that you're participating in? Any? Yeah, right here. We offer a, a variation on the, the on the open entry, open exit classroom, we also um, have turned that into a variable credit or modular environment. So in addition to being continuous enrollment through week eight, um, students can take just what they want to learn, oh, credit by credit, and we do use Canvas. Great. So not only uh, open entry, open exit, but the student really gets to choose how much or how little they learn. That's great. Any others? You want to talk about? We'll have some time at the end, too, to to have questions and other discussion. Um, but let's talk about some of the uh, non-traditional teaching in Canvas. Uh, Canvas works especially well for, as Lee and I have talked about it, uh, passive learning. So things like demonstration and video that you can put online and students can pretty much do that anytime and anywhere. Asynchronous discussion. We all know the discussion tool in, in Canvas and that can be effectively used in a non-traditional learning environment. Then uh, quizzes and assignments and other types of interactive activities are all things that Canvas does really well. And some of the teaching impl implications for these types of, of activities, uh, more student-centered focus and more one-to-one -one with the instructor and the students. That's, that's what we're about at this conference, right? Student-centered learning and less lecturing and more time in a lab type setting where the, the instructor can help the students. And the instructor's role really changes in a, in a non-traditional learning environment where they're doing a lot less lecturing and the instructor is more of a facilitator in, in answering questions and stimulating the students to learn on their own. 
Okay, what we're going to talk about, and we're going to go really quickly because we wanted this to be an interactive session and we want to hear from you and we want to know what you're doing because that's what we're here for is to learn. So here are the awesome, awesome tools that we use for student-centered learning in Canvas. Rubrics, Outcome, and Learning Mastery Gradebook. Who's using Learning Mastery Gradebook yet? Are you loving it? Competency-based learning, this is, we're, we're really happy. Student progress and outcome reporting, we're going to get into some mobile apps, how we use those, video and external apps. Okay, we have um, three programs that utilize rubrics very, very highly. Industrial automation, nursing, and our dental programs. Um, and I'm gonna show you some ways with SpeedGrader that we use them. But in our industrial automation, um, this is an example here. He uses it when he's grading a particular skill. For this one, is, it's a VEX skill that the students are displaying competency for. And I'm sorry, this is really small. We tried to make it fit. But let me tell you, the first criteria, and this is really easy to set up. He has completes all activities. And what he does is he says it's full marks, partially completed, or no marks. The second one is handed in all paperwork. Yes, we're taking baby steps. We will get them off the paperwork. So it's full marks or no marks. Answered all questions on worksheets correctly. It's either all correct or less than 100%. All performance assessments are signed off, either full marks or no marks. We have a rating scale of one to four. And so what happens is at the end of the course, and we use these rubrics to do that, the students are rated between one to four, and that is their level of competency throughout the program and, and when they complete. This is another example in industrial automation, our robotics program. It's a very simple, the end result was it was done correctly with a high level of precision. It's mostly correct with a lower level of precision or not done correctly. This rubric is one that we use in the nursing program. And what's really cool about this is they will take it into clinicals with them. So when the students are out doing their clinicals, the instructor has their tablet and the rubrics with the students, and they will go on and just grade quickly what they do with that. So the next thing we want to talk about is outcomes. And outcomes are really, uh, you can think of outcomes as just the criteria that's used in a, in a rubric. Uh, these are the things that we're wanting to measure in, in mastery-based learning, whether the students have, have mastered a skill or not. Um, so this is the main out, outcome screen. And you can see, maybe you can't see it, might be a little too small, but you have a place where you can add new outcome groups. Um, right here, I think, you can create new outcomes or you can find outcomes if you're within a course and you wanna bring some outcomes that are stored at or created at the account or sub-account level, you can bring into the course. And then by default, there are three levels for each outcome and you can change this, just like you can change any criteria in a rubric but one is exceeds expectation, uh, meets expectation, or does not meet expectation. And then you also have a mastery level that's set, in this case, by default as uh, three points. Um, and, and you can customize all that. There are other options as well, but if you're interested more, we're not gonna focus a lot on outcomes, but there was a session last, uh, last half hour that was really good on outcomes. So, Catch that on, on YouTube if, if you missed that. So I uh, just want to quickly give a couple best practices. If, you're, if you want to use outcomes for reporting at a higher level within your organization, you should create your outcomes at that root account level or the sub-account level. Um, because outcomes reporting doesn't uh, use the course level outcomes in those reports. You can still get information on mastery at the course level, but if you want to do outcomes reporting, you're going to want to uh, create those outcomes at the, at the account or sub-account level. And then another thing that's useful is to create those outcome groups, and then all those outcomes that are logically grouped together, you can import those all at once into a course. Okay, so this shows you how you would, once you've created an outcome, 
you can bring it into a course. Right here you have the find outcome button here within your rubric. And when you click that, you have a place where you can search for your outcome or outcome groups. And in this case, we're choosing this, this project uh, outcome group. And then you have an import button that you can import that into your, your rubric. So when you click import, you see that new outcome just like the other criteria within your rubric. And it appears down here. There's a little icon on the left that indicates that that's an outcome and not just a regular criteria. Um, also, you can, when you import it, you can either choose to use that criteria for scoring within the rubric or not. So if you, in this case, it is using it for scoring, but if you don't have to, and you can evaluate the outcome separately from the other criteria in your rubric. So there are different calculation methods for outcomes as well. Until a couple months ago, you just had this single option to use the highest score for the, as the outcome score. But now Canvas has provided us with three other options. This one uses the most recent score. So if, you, if you're only concerned about the last score that they had, you can use the most recent score. Or you can use an n number of times. So if, if you, you don't consider just one time as mastery, you can choose two times or three times as your number of mastery. Or they've also added another one, which is called the decaying average, where you give a percentage that's weighted on the last score right there. Whoops, move back. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, so we have our, our decaying average right here. Um, in this case, it's weighted 65% on that last score, and then the other scores are averaged. So you can weight the last score higher if you want, and then average all the rest. Okay, uh, with, the, with outcomes, you, you also have the ability to use the Learning Mastery Gradebook. And this is really, really cool. For competency-based learning, why not use it? Um, it is a feature option that has to be turned on within the course, and then you have, as part of your gradebook, you have the Learning Mastery tab up here at the top. And then you can see all of your outcomes that are in the course that appear as your columns in the Learning Mastery gradebook. And you have uh, colors, color coding that represents whether the students have either exceeded that mastery, met the mastery criteria, the yellow indicates they're near mastery, or uh, the red indicates well below mastery. And as you move over, uh, you, you also have the ability to an export a report from the Learning Mastery Gradebook. As you move over any of your outcomes columns here, you'll have a little pop-up that will show you a pie graph uh, for that outcome across all the students in your course. So you can again see it a, um, in a representation of the pie graph, how many have exceeded the criteria, met the criteria, or haven't met the criteria yet. So Lee's going to talk a little bit about how you might use uh, outcomes in recording progress. Or reporting progress. Um, one of the things that we've decided to do, see on the very bottom you will see time and attempts. Um, what we've done is we've used time as an outcome. So for a student to become mastered in this particular assignment, and it can be pretty broad, we have attached an hour to that because our students are enrolled for so many hours per week. And so what we do is when they have completed that assignment or it could even be at a course level, we just click on that and they have so much time associated with that. We can run that outcome report and so if we have a student that is enrolled for 30 hours a week and they've been enrolled in the program for 60 hours and they have completed 90 hours worth of work, they are progressing satisfactorily. Does that make sense? So that's one of the ways that we have found that we can use outcomes in rubrics to kind of track our students. Oh, I was just asking how you got the time component in the rubric, if it's automatically added somehow, or you put it in manually. 
what we did through our programs was we said, okay, we can't have a rubric that's 14 miles long. So you're going to have to come up with skill sets and attach times to those skill sets. And so we have some programs that will go anywhere from a half an hour to five hours. And we have other programs that have skill sets that are 30, 60, 90 hours. So it, it came really from the department. They, they figured out what they wanted to do for that skill set. Does that make sense? And, and then that's an outcome. And that's an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, to track their actual time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if they completed that assignment or skill, then that, they get credited with that skill. Yes, when they complete that assignment or skill, they get credit for that amount of time. So if they complete it in 15 hours, we're going to show 30 hours because that student progressed at that rate. Some students, we give them time and a half for federal financial aid. Um, so, you know, if, if it's a 60 hour and they've only completed 30, they're still, according to financial aid, progressing satisfactorily. Okay, and I alluded to how we would use SpeedGrader. This is in our um, nursing program. Um, our nurses go out and they sit bedside. Our dental program sits chairside. And they actually click through the rubric. They've done this, they've done this, they've done this. And another thing that we found that works really, really well is they, they provide comments and feedback for the students. And it's also helped because the students used to come in after they'd completed one of their labs and they would say, no, I know I did that correctly. Well now, because they have the feedback, they know what they did incorrectly and they're not coming to the instructors as much and saying, no, that's not right, I did it right. So that's really helped us there. So if, if you're in an environment that you want to be able to evaluate several students at once, then you can use the magic marker tool on the iPad. How many have used magic marker before? Okay, just a couple. Um, this is a screenshot of magic marker, and you can <laughs> organize your students in groups, which they call uh, tables, right here. So you create, you create tables, and then you add your students to those tables. They don't have to be physical tables, but it's a way of grouping students that you're gonna to evaluate together. And then you can evaluate the group by just swiping up on the table. So that's a positive result on whatever <coughs> outcome you select at the top. So you can swipe across the screen to select your outcome. And then you can either evaluate the students individually by just swiping up on the student or swiping down to indicate they have not mastered that. And then Canvas will record that and, and uh, in the Learning Mastery Gradebook. So let's uh, take an example. It, say we, we uh, tapped on Panda here, and we would see this screen. So we can see more details about the, the various outcomes and the, and the mastery. Uh, this discussion outcome, for example, is 100%. So that's, that student has had 100% on that outcome. So if you haven't played with Magic Marker and you're using outcomes, I'd, I'd urge you to play with it. It may not work for you, but it could be a, a really good fit for your uh, evaluation. Yeah, question? I just wanted to point out that uh, Magic Marker is, I think, it's still strictly for Apple devices. We were going to try to implement this in our school and our cosmetology department bought the wrong kind of <laughs> tablet, so. <laughs> and, and not only just Apple devices, but iPad only. But it will be coming for Android, I'm sure. Okay, uh, then this just shows that using the Magic Marker app, it has updated the score for that student on that outcome right there. Um, anybody, oh, question, yeah. Um, uh, what workaround do you have on the magic marker if you make a mistake because okay. you can't erase it? <laughs> that, that is another problem with magic marker that if you accidentally swipe down to indicate that student did not master it, there's not a way to undo that right now. So the only thing you could do is maybe um, erase it, kind of erase it with a positive result. I don't know. Does anybody else have a solution for that problem? That is a problem right now. 
So uh, mobile apps will, another mobile app is Polls. Is anybody using Polls for Canvas? This is available for both Android and iOS that is just set up to ask a quick, quick uh, poll question. Now this would be more appropriate for a, a, a kind of a traditional classroom like this if we wanted to, to administer a poll and have a, a quick uh, result of how the audience is feeling. How many are using clickers? So a few. Could this, could this be, replace your clickers? Thought, just a thought. Yeah, it doesn't feed into the grade book at all right now, but it's it's a way you can get feedback. Okay, videos. How many are using videos in Canvas? How easy is it to use videos in Canvas? Let me tell you a little story. Um, we, because we're open entry, open exit, we serve twelve different high schools. Think about just your students and. The, their friends that have a different schedule. <laughs> we accept students at any time. Our high schools all have different times. Think about programs that have a lot of safety, machining, cabinet making, building construction. You cannot turn those students loose in a lab until they're competent in that safety material. Our cabinet making instructor was only teaching safety because we had students coming all the time and he was getting very, very frustrated. So what we did was, using Canvas and videos, we went out to every machine and videoed what he did on his lecture for safety, and he is the happiest guy in the world. He does not teach safety anymore. And when the students come to him, guess what? They understand what they're supposed to do on the machines, and he's out in the lab teaching what he wants to be teaching, not the boring stuff. Yeah, question here, or a comment? So are you posting your, your videos on YouTube and then just linking, or are you embedding them, or are you just uploading an MP4? We are actually embedding them. Um, I have a person that works for me that's awesome, and as you can see on the slide on the left, how it's got the instructor's name. What she has done is she's actually gone in, because these are going to be long-term videos. When there was a key concept, she would overlay um, words as to here are the things that you need to do, and then we just em embedded them directly right into Canvas. Uh, yeah, it's a quick question. Um, the guy that uh, is over my tech area would be the one to ask the question, but since I'm here, we've been having some trouble with videos in Apple devices via Canvas. Has anybody had trouble with videos in Apple devices, or is that just maybe unique to us? question. Anybody else had, have you, we haven't, we haven't had any trouble either. Can I ask that question? <laughs> yeah, we haven't had problems. Okay, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to fly through the rest real quickly. Um, how many use external apps, okay, through LTI or something? This is like an example of Quizlet, which is kind of a flashcard generation type program, and you can either develop your own flashcards or you can go search the Quizlet uh, community and bring in things that are appropriate. So this has a definition on one side, and then you you click and you can see the term on the on the other side like that. Uh, there are these are some of the the apps that we use at Ogden Weaver uh, Tech College, and you probably can't read that, but we have uh, we have the chat app. We use Cranium Cafe, Lockdown Browser, and so on. Um, there are lots of apps that you can find in the App Center, the Canvas App Center, and here's just a, a visual presentation of some of the apps you can find there. They're also available at eduappcenter.org if you, or is it com? I'm not sure. I think it's dot com. Okay, so we wanted to leave some time for, for you. We've asked a few questions as we've gone along, but what, uh, what questions do you have or what comments do you want to Talk about. What do you want to show off? Yeah. Well, probably my ignorance, but <laughs> my, my question to you is you're using rubrics to help in your, in your grading and your scoring. Are they still requiring, does it still require the instructor intervention to score the rubric, or have you managed to come up with some way to do that in an automated way? Well, there, um, I didn't show this when I was talking about outcomes. But you can align outcomes with question banks. So there is, uh, if you use quizzes and draw, drew questions from the question bank, you could automatically score some of those, those outcomes. 
But if in a typical speed grader situation, you're going to have to go and, and just click the cells to evaluate. Okay. Other question? Yeah, right here. In speed grader or the magic marker, in speed grader or magic marker, are there a place for comments to be loaded that the student can then go in? And is there a way, or are they doing where they can become a discussion based comment back and forth? Yes. Do you want to answer that, Lee? Or? There is a place that you can enter free form comments on a, on a rubric and uh, just appears as a bubble out at the end. And all those comments, you can also enter general comments when you evaluate the assignment. And that can be kind of a discussion going back and forth with the instructor. Rubrics are awesome. You can also even use, whether you're using SpeedGrader or on the iPad or through the uh, computer, you can actually record your voice if you'd rather do that. Um, you mentioned the polls app, and you said it doesn't get recorded to the grade book. How does the reporting, like how do you get what the answers are? And does that come through on Canvas anywhere? Or? Uh, the polling app uh, does not come through in, on Canvas anywhere, but the instructor can see the results of the poll and they can actually release it to the students as well, I believe. Is there like a full report on, you know, how many students answered yes or no or something like that, or is it all individual response? You, you get an overall uh, okay. response of all across the whole class. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You can import it in. Oh, you can import. I mean, you have to do a little, it's just a grade book. So. You can import. The These guys go into the, the back end yeah. of Canvas. They can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wish we could go on, but we're out of time. But thank you for coming, and I hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks.